Hey folks, you might remember this, my Strix Vega 64, and the car that has absurd my own GTX 1080 as the mainstay in my primary PC. Now overall I've been extremely happy with it, and in my previous Vega 64 video I showed some small tweaks that you should do to get the most out of the card, which kinda comes from the factory in a fairly timid state, all of course without overclocking it. And while on the whole a lot of you like the look of the card, especially since it can now be had for well below its initial MSRP, with even better deals cropping up on the used market, the few negative comments on that video revolved around one theme. The VRM cooling. And to be honest, there might have been some validity to the concern, as there is actually one fairly serious issue with the design of this particular card that might cause problems depending on the rest of your setup. The problem? Well, you can just about see the issue down here. One of the components on the VRM is not actually touching the third pad. Now, this could lead to the car reporting higher temperatures, it could lead to itself throttling to try and keep those temperatures down, or it could even result to crashing and black screening, or windows simply jettisoning the display driver. A definite area of concern then, that you might have noticed by the copious use of the word could. It's not something that I have experienced myself. But then again, I do really like to use Radeon Chill, which lowers frame rates to a set value to conserve power and lower heat production when not much is going on, and I also like to have the maximum and minimum frame rates set to within the ranges of my FreeSync monitor, which again can lead to the Vega 64 downclocking in less GPU intensive scenes, which drastically drops temperatures, noise and power draw. So although I've not actually run into these troubles, I know that a lot of you simply want the car to run as fast as it can at all times. And well, even though I'm not seeing the issues per se, I don't really like the idea of potential problems going unchecked. So the first protocol is obviously to test out what temperatures we're getting when the Strix Vega 64 is in its stock state. So to do that we've got to turn off Radeon Chill and any frame rate caps and just let the car run as fast as it can through a time spy stress test and log the results. Now I am going to be keeping my own custom undervolted profile, as this does offer much better performance than out of the box and you'd be silly not to. And the fan speed has been set to a max about 2400 RPM, which is well below the maximum speed of the card, but it's still fairly quiet in my case, which in this case is the Corsair 500D. So with that done and a full set of data logged, it's time to apply the new thermal pad. We're using a minus pad 8 from Thermal Grizzly, 20mm by 120mm by 3mm thick, and it was purchased off of Overclockers UK for around about 12 quid. The Strix Vega 64 comes apart really easily with just 6 screws holding the cooling solution to the PCB, 4 around the GPU and 2 at the rear. And once the fan and RGB cables have been unplugged, the card simply comes apart as you would expect, with no hidden issues. And looking at the OEM thermal pad, you can see where the issues may come from. Contact to the VRM is haphazard at best and pretty shocking at worst, with it completely missing some of the VRM components while not really offering full coverage to many others. The thermal pad we're changing to is not only a little bit thicker, which will actually spread out when it's tightened up, but it's also longer, ensuring that lone FET in the outmost side of the card is going to be fully covered when we reassemble it. Obviously the standard graphics card's rule of thumb applies here and I've taken the opportunity to remove the OEM thermal paste and reapply it with some fairly average MX2, so nothing high performance or fancy, but with ASUS's approach to the VRM cooling I didn't want to take any chances. With the card reassembled, it's time for the moment of truth, room temperatures are the same and idle temperatures of the GPU are in the same ballpark, and the Ryzen 7 CPU is in the low 30s at idle just like it was before the pad change. The time spy stress test was run again, and for the same duration and all the data was logged, with some interesting findings. First up, the GPU temperatures with the stock Tim in blue and the MX2 reapplication in green. And here it was neck and neck for the first few minutes as the GPU temperature reached a point of equilibrium with set fan speed. With the MX2, this happened a lot sooner and seen the card level out with an average of around 69 degrees whereas the stock Tim was starting to settle out around 72 degrees by the end of the test but it was actually still climbing. HBM temps, they seen a nice drop too, right off the bat, being around 5 degrees cooler by the end of the test, and like the GPU temperatures, reaching that state of equilibrium with the set fan speed fairly quickly into the stress test. 
the GPU hotspot temperature was interesting with the stock solution initially performing better than the MX2 before falling behind at the end of the test. But the graphics card with the repaste in place was actually achieving consistently higher clock speeds during the stress test, so that might have something to do with the stock tim looking a little bit more favourable in the initial stages. So a bit of a side note, but it was a worthwhile endeavour to change the paste, even if it was just for saving a few degrees here and there, and achieving slightly higher clock speeds. But the thermal paste application was never really in question on the Strix Vega 64, and it turned out to just be a cherry on top of what is actually a pretty tasty cake, as the difference in VRM temperatures, well it's here that we see the most impressive change. The memory VRM at stock was heading well towards 90 degrees C at the end of the stress test, and it was still rising when completed. With the correctly sized thermal pads in place though, the temperature plateaued at 75 degrees, and as you can see by the curve of the graph, heated up much more slowly, showing that the pad is doing the job that it's supposed to. And while a decrease of 13 degrees C is impressive, it's absolutely nothing compared to the SOC VRM. With the stock VRM cooling solution seen here, the card reached a still climbing 98 degrees C by the end of the test, so I can't actually quite believe the report of the 100 plus degrees VRM temperatures reported by some users. With the minus pad 8 though, these temperatures dropped by almost 20 degrees and levelled out at 81 degrees C, which is pretty remarkable for a 12 pound pad. So with a considerable drop in VRM temperatures, it should be fairly clear that yes, the Strix Vega 64 has fundamental design flaws with its VRM cooling, which is a shame as it's a beautiful and very quiet version of the Vega 64, restrained looking but with enough flair to make it feel that little bit special. That said, while there's a definite issue, it is one that's fairly easily fixed, and truth be told, this video is probably lasting longer than the time it took to apply the fix. The thing is though, especially at this higher end of the market, you really shouldn't have to be applying fixes to your spanking new components, and not everyone would A be comfortable doing it themselves, or B be willing to go through a lengthy RMA process with ASUS, and being without a card while we let them investigate the problem. When it comes to doing it yourself, there's also the problematic issue of your manufacturer's warranty. Now having spoken to two different people within ASUS, I got two different answers to whether undertaking this fix myself would void warranty or not. One of them was absolutely adamant that the card would need to be sent back to the location of purchase with a valid RMA ticket. Whereas the other one says as long as there's no damage to the card, it's perfectly fine. So I can't really give you any other advice in this regards, other than to check if your warranty is direct with ASUS or your retailer, and get documented acceptance that your warranty is going to remain intact if you undertake this fix. For me, well, the Strix Vega 64 is now running cooler than ever, and that's only amplified when using radio and chill, and keeping the FPS within my monitor's free sync range. So the new pad and thermal paste is definitely doing a much better job than the stock solution. So with a drop in temperatures across all workloads that I've tested, I'm more than happy with the results of this quick little fix. No, you shouldn't have to do it, but if you are suffering issues, then at least you know there are easy to apply solutions. Now I hope you've enjoyed this little investigation into the Strix Vegas thermal solution, it's not like I need much encouragement to dismantle things, and being able to drop temperatures and even increase clock speeds a little thanks to that extra thermal headroom has been more than worthwhile. If you found it interesting in the slightest, feel free to share this video around, like and subscribe, and I'd also love to know if any of you are planning to do something similar with your cards, and what results you've seen from it. But for now, take care, and I'll see you all in the comments section down below, and in the next video.